Hi, welcome to Inside the Minds of Authors, the interview show dedicated to get us up close and personal on what drives authors, where they get their ideas from, and the things that keep them going. I'm DC Gomez, an indie author, and come and join me in these fun conversations. Hi, everybody. DC Gomez here. I am here with the talented Mr. Tom C. Greer, who is a children's author. Tom, what are you going to be reading for us? I'm going to be reading um, my last uh, book that's out called Granny's Porch. And it's um, dedicated, of course, to my grandmother who passed many years ago. But it's just all about the great things that you do on your granny's porch. Awesome. Can't wait to listen to us. I hope you guys enjoy it. Granny's Porch by Tom C. Greer, illustrated by Eric Hammond. Everyone has a special place they like to go. My favorite spot is Granny's Porch. There are so many things I love to do on Granny's Porch, like read a good story, laugh with friends, sing silly songs, cry because it really hurts, dance like a wild animal, be Granny's helper. Eat Granny's fried chicken. And take a nap on the softest lap in the world. But most of all, I love to get lots of hugs and kisses. So, Tom, thank you for that. I am excited. By the way, the illustration is fabulous. So, thank you. tell us, tell us a little bit of the background. You tell us it's inspired by your granny. Can you tell us a little more? I'm an educator, and a lot of kids now are not really familiar with a porch. Lots of grannies, grandpas live in apartments and that kind of thing, and it's kind of taken away from the whole. Um, hanging out on the porch with your family and that kind of thing. I was just reflecting back on my childhood when we would go visit my grandparents and how the porch was like where everything happened. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of build relationships between kids and their grandparents again. And I thought it would be a great book for grandparents to read to their grandchildren because they could remember back and reminisce on things that they might have done uh, on their grandparents' porch and just that it was a fun, fun place to be. So that's kind of what inspired me to do it. I love it. It's actually a very beautiful story. And you're right, right now we don't have enough kids that play outside. Right. And the idea of porch is like, what's a porch? What am I doing? So I love it. So tell us, what is the ideal age for this book? The ideal age for Granny's Porch is going to be a is probably a kindergarten, first grade. So beyond probably first grade, maybe second grade, it's just not going to be, probably be of interest to kids. Okay. So this particular title, I would say, you know, pre-K, kinder to first, maybe second. It is a beautiful, beautiful story to tell you know, to your little ones to take them in and kind of explore them and getting them started to thinking about it. Like what are some of the things that they enjoy about their grandparents or even their parents? I'm a librarian right now in Dallas and Ooh, that's exciting. Uh, yes. And I've read this book actually to an older group. And so I would kind of extend it and tie other things in with it. So if you're reading it and you're able to extend it out you know, to draw those older kids in. What do you mean in, by extending? How, how do you extend it? Give me a little bit. Like one page of the book talks about eating fried chicken with granny. It was one of the fun things to do. So we talked about, you know, well, what are some things that you like to eat when you go to your grandparents okay. or hang out with your grandparents or that kind of thing. There's were like laughing with friends, playing games and that kind of thing. And you can pull into the whole thing of, 
you know, when I was little, we did this, we played out and we pretended we were on a pirate ship or we did this or we did this. And we could compare and contrast how things have changed now as opposed to then and that kind of thing. So you can kind of draw them in okay. to the book that way. So you can make this a really interactive Yes. with your kids, not just the pages to make it come to life for them. Absolutely. And I have a makerspace. Ooh, tell me about it. What's a makerspace? In, in my library. So a makerspace is an area that is um, basically set up for the kids to collaborate. Okay. And learn how to work together, uh, which is kind of tough sometimes for young kids to work together because they want to do everything. But um, it's got Legos, it's got connecting straws, it's got magnets, it's I got... One. Yeah. And so I read the book and some of the kids then went over to the makerspace and some of them used the straws that you can connect together. Some of them used Legos, but they actually created a granny's porch um, in the makerspace. That is so adorable. So they were able to, you know, take it and they were able to put figures with it and, you know, do maybe what they would do or, or talk to me about what they would do with the porch. But makerspaces aren't that new, but mm -hmm. a lot of people really don't know about them. I think and I'm so, just the generation that knows about them. Like I'm the generations that we're going to have a makerspace and I'm going, what are we making? What does that mean? Well, STEM learning, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is really big now. And so a lot of the makerspaces have like magnets and circuit boards and, and all that kind of thing. But I mean, they can really be any area in the library or classroom that's set up to extend the lesson or just to give the kids an opportunity to um, collaborate, work together, and come up with a pro you know, do a project together. So um, I always try to add that on when I read a book to my students when they come in, give them an opportunity to go over then and extend the lesson or reflect on the lesson, that kind of thing. So the, the actual hands-on participation makes us think in even more. Right. Because we all have different types of learners. Right. So if you're the kind of learner that needs to do something, like the makerspace sounds ideal for them to make it real. Right. And we even have, um, I've even had pre-K kids come in and kids that are in specialized classes um, with learning disabilities. And of course, they need lots of hands-on things a lot of times. So they're able to go in and, you know, create things and be a part just like everybody else is. So that's really cool. That is actually awesome. So let's talk a little bit about you. Okay. So I, I love the book. I love where you're going with this. I like the things that you're doing with it. Okay. And, and taking it to the kids in a different level. So tell me a little bit. I know you're an educator. Right. But how long have you been writing? Gosh. I'm trying to give give my age away. Um, some ranges. I mean, I've been writing. I mean, I've been writing forever. But the first book that I actually wrote that's published now is A New Home for Honey. And it first came out in 2006. It's when it was actually published. But I wrote the book probably early 2000s, um, and basically it sat in a drawer um, in a desk at my house for several years, and it was just a story because I'm not an illustrator, but um, finally I pulled that drawer open and I said, you know what, I'm going to do something with this. I'm tired of it laying here. This is a book that kids would really, really like, and... Um, you know, so I found someone to help me out and take it to the next level. So, 2000-ish. So, tell me a little bit about that story. Okay. What is it about? Like, fill us in. Uh, a New Home for Honey? Yes. Okay. So, I have uh, the Adventures of Honey series, which is three books, and they're actually about a family pet that I used to own. Um, I was an adult when I got her. I had moved back to Texarkana and was living with my mom, and we had lost um, our dog, Candy. Um, she had died from old age, that kind of thing. And my mom told me, do not go get another dog, because I was living with her temporarily, and she's like, don't do it. This is, sounds very specific, Tom. Like, yeah. Like, don't do this. Don't do it. So what did you do? I went and got a dog, <laughs> of course. And I found her, she was a puppy, 
and uh, she was over in the South Texarkana area, and I was actually substitute teaching, and I had been called to go in and substitute for a half day in the afternoon. And that morning, I went over and looked at this puppy and fell in love with her and bought her and brought her home and said, Mother, here's, here's my new dog, and I need you to watch her because I've got to go to work. So not only you brought a new dog home, Right. Now we're asking mom, you need to watch the dog that you told me not to get. Right. Okay. Basically. Just basically sure. so. Okay. Yeah. So um, I left her there and I went on to work and that's kind of where uh, a new home for honey, that's kind of where it starts. Um, okay. The story is a true story. Um, the illustrator that I got, her name is Laurie Faust and she lives in Noblesville, Indiana. And I found her through an online um, search engine and talked with her. And I sent her photographs of my mom's house, of me, of my mom, of uh, the backyard, of the dog. And I said, I want you to make the illustrations look as much like the real thing as possible. I don't want you just to make up something. I want it to look like it really is. And so she said she would do that, and she did. And so the story goes that I leave and I go to work, and my mom takes the dog outside, and she runs through the yard, and she loves it. And I come home from work, and we sit out in the backyard, and we come up with a name for the dog. And she was kind of the color of um, apricot, I would say. But uh, the story says that she didn't want to be called apricot she liked the name Honey more. And since Honey and Apricot are kind of similar colors, she was like a beigey color. Uh, she said she liked the name Honey more. So she was very happy with her name. And uh, the book ends with her crying in a box at the first night. And of course, Tommy, the boy in the story, what does he do? But he gets her out of the box and he puts her in the bed with him. And so, um, that book is the one that stayed in the drawer for many years and I was teaching in Lancaster, Texas then and I carried it to school and read the story to several of the second and third grade classes and I said now this is not a book book yet it's just a story and I I had made a little book just out of copy paper and so I was turning pages but I showed them there's no pictures here and they loved the story it is a beautiful story. Yeah, they loved the story. In fact, one class ended up creating a bulletin board after I read the story because that, uh, that book really lends itself to talking about feelings and emotions because Honey was at the beginning, she was very scared. She didn't know where she was going. Then she got to the new house and she fell in love with the backyard and then she was scared again at night but then she was comfortable and happy because she ended up in the bed. So there's a lot of things that you can tie in there with feelings and emotions. Um, so that book is, was very popular, so I went ahead and did two more books about honey. Uh, one of them is actually a true, another true story, and the other one has elements of truth in it. I like the fact that you bring the real and the imagination and the colors and make stories that a lot of the kids can relate and they can take it and they're very practical, they're very ageless, which I think is beautiful about them. Is that something you did on purpose? I did because you said that everybody has a story, even pets. And, um, you know, I want them to understand that pets become a part of the family, a real part of the family. And while we can't get in their heads, um, they do have their own stories. And, um, you know, in allowing them to share their stories with us, we can grow and we can learn and we can change. We can explore, you know, by taking advantage of the fact that we have this four-legged little creature in our house. Um, as you know very oh, well. Is, yes. Um, they come with their own personalities regardless of what we think. Yes, they really, really do. And they do teach us patience. You know, as much as you think that an animal is not going to teach you something, you tend to grow just by having to deal with this other essence in your space. Right. So tell me, 
we're going we're to keep trying to dig a little bit into what's in your mind, what, what drives you. What is your definition of success? Ooh, I think my definition of success would be with not giving up, but um, setting a goal and meeting that goal. And that doesn't mean that you may not have to change some things on the goal, that you might have to tweak it a little bit because that's okay. But um, finishing, some, starting something and finishing it to me is um, success. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's important because I've had times in my life where I, I left a job before I really thought I should, but circumstances in life got in the way. And so I was then able a few years later to go back to a similar position at that same school and finish the year and finish it. So when I left there, I felt as though it was complete and I felt successful in that because that little piece of my life still just was out there kind of wandering around. A little dangling on the side. A little side. dangling on the okay. side and now it's, um, you know, it's complete. Then tell me, what is your biggest accomplishment, whether it is in writing, whether it is in your personal life, professional life, what is your biggest accomplishment? Oh, you want to get personal. As okay. personal as you want. We, we, get old, <laughs> we, we can leave it up to you. What does that mean? Well, I think probably the biggest accomplishments in my life um, was um, in 2018. Uh, my dad had been battling dementia and was still living by himself at 94 years old. And he had started falling a lot and um, ended up in the hospital and left the hospital and went to hospice where he stayed one night until he passed. And about three weeks later, my mom found out that not only was her body covered in lung cancer, but it had spread to her bones already. And so um, from the day my dad passed on May 9th, uh, my mom passed July 15th. Oh, Tom, and that's a lot. that was nine weeks apart. And they were divorced, but neither had remarried. But my mom, of course, I was living with her at that time. And um, I watched her turn from my mom into an infant. Um, because she was not able to take care of herself and um, something I would never wish on anyone ever and it hurt her so much because my sister and I um, were changing her diaper and I don't do well with that kind of thing and not many but people you, do I hope you realize yeah. okay and you jump but you just jump in and it's like I'm doing this because I have to do it and because it's my mom and I want to do it because I love her and she did it for me but it hurt her but at the same time um, I think just handling and dealing with their deaths so quickly together um, I think is is probably my biggest accomplishment. What helped you heal through that? My faith, uh, my faith, uh, my family, my friends. Um, but you know, truly, my faith in in knowing that I believe personally that they are healed and they are whole, and they're in no more pain, and. Um, so now I know that the best thing I can do for them is to be as successful as possible and honor them and their memory. Um, they both were at a local hospice here that I could not say more great things about. Both of them actually were only there for one night until they passed. And um, they created a special garden there and planted trees and allowed the opportunity for us to buy trees um, in memory of our loved ones. 
That is beautiful. And so I donated to buy trees in memory of my dad and my mom. And there's a sign out front now that's got their names on it. Oh. And that kind of thing. I mean, there's a sign that's got a lot of names. But um, I just wanted that for them because they're buried in different locations. And as strange as it may be, when I feel like I want to visit their grave site or whatever, one's buried 30 miles away. But when I go out there, I just feel close to both of them because that's where they both took their last breaths. Is their spirit is still there? Is yeah. that memory and that connection? Yeah. So, with that same sentiment, so we're talking about your biggest accomplishment. You know, would that be one of your biggest lessons? What What would that lesson be if you had to think about it? What is your biggest lesson that you can share with us? I think that one of the biggest lessons that I could share with people is be true to who you are. It's okay to fail. Um, and what matters more than anything is what you do. And we all know that. Um, in the midst of the storm, though, it's easy to get sidetracked. And I think one of my biggest lessons is if you believe in something and it's really worth fighting for, stick with it. And um, that's one thing that, I'm, that I do with my writing. You know, um, I've laid it to the side before. And then I come back to it because I love it. And now in retiring from um, being a librarian and going full time into my books, I think, you know, a lesson for me is there's lots of kids out there who can benefit from what you can do for them. And they're waiting for you. They don't know they're waiting for you, but I've got to take the steps to get out to them and not give up easily because this is something you really believe in. So, you know, the lesson is if there's something you believe in, stick with it, keep working for it. I like the fact that you mentioned it's okay to fail. Yeah. So many times we give up at the first failure. We, we give up when something doesn't work out. How hard is it to get up when you fail? It can be very hard. Um, that's why I also believe in the whole community aspect. Um, you've got to have a community. You've got to have people that support you. You've got to have people who love you um, because there's always going to be people out there who um, there's going to be some that want you to fail for whatever reason. Maybe they're jealous. Uh, maybe or, they're or intimidated. Sometimes or intimidated. Um, but, you know, you've got to surround yourself with like-minded people. And uh, that's, you know, one of the reasons I'm so thankful that we met when we met because there just was um, a bond there in some way. Little did I know you lived three blocks down the street from me. Around the corner. Around the corner. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I get discouraged, um, I have special people that I can go to that really get me primed up and going again. And, um, you know, I think that's that's really really important it takes a village and sometimes we don't know it takes a village and we mm -hmm. take a village for granted but it does take a village so i am so excited that we can embrace failure and we can take it a step forward and we can realize it is okay to fail i, I love that saying and and it gives us a whole bunch of courage yeah so tell me do you have a favorite book or what is your favorite book I know you say you have many. What is your favorite book oh, at this time? All, you know, all the D.C. Gomez books are my favorites. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, I skim a lot of books being in the library, um, the children's, you know, the elementary library setting. Um, when, I, when I read, it's like Dean Koontz has always been a, a favorite of mine because I can pick up one of his books and in the first chapter I know either I'm going to read it or I'm never going to finish it because typically a book has to grab my attention and you know these things yes. um, at the very beginning uh, if it doesn't you'll lay it down and most likely you'll never go back to it um, but several of his books I mean it's like and his books are thick but it's like I read it and I don't get up it's until I finish it. It is a journey. I mean, it's like, and you know, your books that I've read so far, um, the intern diaries, 
I've sit them down, but I go right back to them very quickly. And um, so, you know, I'll say Dean Koontz and DC Gomez. I am completely, absolutely honored about this. And yes, I did not pay him to say no that. No payment was There's received. No, no payment was received for that compliment. Absolutely, he is right. amazing about that. So I, I'm excited. But one of the things that we want to do is always take people on a journey. Yeah. You know I mean, and I think when a book can do that, one of the things that I hear a lot of people tell me is, I don't read. And usually what I think is like you haven't found the right book yet. Right. Because once you do, you realize, I might not read that, but this I enjoy. So you talked a little bit about favorite books, favorite author. What inspires you? What author or book has inspired you in your career? Well, I always think about the Clifford books. Okay. You know, the Clifford the Dog books. And, you know, I always said that I wanted Honey to be the next Clifford. I wanted us to take take... Clifford away where people didn't know what Clifford was but I think any author who has a huge series of books um, it's kind of like a TV show you know you have so many episodes of the show so you have to recreate many 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 times and I was going to do that with Honey and then my interest kind of changed over and that kind of thing but um, authors who do that who have a huge series uh, they inspire me I would love to be able to say I want to be the author that has 10, 27 books in the same series. I might a little bit too ADD. Like yeah. five might be the most. I'm like, I don't know if I can keep going with the same character because I want them to do something differently. Right. But authors that could do that very well are my, I, completely mind-blowing to me. I'm like, that is amazing that you can keep me captivating for 10 books. I'm usually blown away. Well, and you build, a, you know, you build an audience. I mean, now there's, you know, little kids who, I mean, they just can't wait for that next book to come. Just like people with your chapter books, um, you know, they're waiting for the next one in the series to come out, and they're bugging you about it and that kind of thing. So and they're really sweet about it. Well, yeah, little hints, like but so. you know, right? But I mean, it's not like you know, you've got thirty of you know one series or whatever, but. Um, it can be very uh, inspiring for an author to have people waiting for their next book. It makes you want to write faster. Yeah. So, talking about next, tell yes. me a little bit about your current project. What are you working on? Okay. What, what's Tom up to? So, give me an insight. What can we be expecting from you? What, what do you got going on? Okay. So, um, Granny's Porch came out, and then I, I started thinking about, okay... Well, not only was Granny's porch really great, but my grandpa had a shed in the back of his house. And, you know, I, you have to get past the fact that a lot of people think that they only went to the shed to get a spanking. <laughs> because, you know, you, I'm going to take you behind the shed and give you a spanking. And that's not the purpose of it. But it's, it's a similar title. Um, it'll have the same boy in it. And um, it's just him hanging out with Grandpa. And they did very different things. So this book has been written and it's being illustrated now. Um, Eric Hammond is the illustrator of bo both of the books. And he lives in Florida and he does amazing, amazing work. Um, so he has created the cover for Grandpa's Shed. I did get to see it, and I love it, so I'm excited and, to see it. Um, yeah. The completed project is coming, so I can't wait. The completed project is coming, hopefully uh, sometime before summer. Um, but the other big thing that I'm really working on now is uh, putting together more programs that I can go out to schools and do uh, and other venues. Um, I love the maker space, and I know that there's lots of teachers, librarians, especially in the small rural towns that may not be familiar with it. So I'm working on presentations for educators um, as far as makerspace goes, how to incorporate that into your day. Um, and then also different programs uh, for each of my books okay, that I can go and share. Tell me a little bit what is your program. Give me a program scenario. So people that are not familiar with an author taking a book and bringing it to life and bringing a program. What can, what can a educator, a teacher, a librarian expect when Tom comes to their school and says, I have a program for you? Okay, so um, A New Home for Honey. Okay, A New Home for Honey is the first book. 
And I'm fortunate because I have all of the rough drafts of that book. I started that book on pen and paper and lots of markouts, lots of strike throughs, that kind of thing. And then it went to um, a typewriter, believe it or not. Oh, wow. We yeah. went old school with this. Yes. Okay. I'm digging it. And then uh, we went to the homemade copy of the book where it was folded, the one that I read to the kids. Um, so I can go in with that and I can show the kids the book as it is now. And I can say, this did not start like this. We can go back to the very beginning. We can go back to when I wrote it out on pen and paper, just like the pens and papers that they have in their writing classes right now. This would be something maybe for third grade, fourth grade students, um, maybe so second is, grade. This is an awesome way to show kids how to make their own picture books. Right, the whole writing process. Okay. We go through the writing process. We talk about capitalization, punctuation, spelling, um, usage, making sure we're putting the right verbs in and that kind of thing, which they're, they're familiar or should be familiar with that. Um, we can show them how the, the pieces fall together. I have the rough drafts of A New Home for Honey, the illustrations as well. I have the pencil where she pencil drew the illustrations. So I share them with the kids and say, here's this, here's this page of the book, and you see it's pencil, and then I hold up the actual book and say, this is what it become. So when you write one thing down, when you write your paper, and you tell your teacher, this is my final copy, and they say, no, this is why. The first thing that you do is not going to be your final copy. You know, you go through that whole process. So as a presenter, as a performer, as a program, I can go in and reinforce what the teachers are saying because I've actually seen teachers sitting at the back of one of my programs nodding their heads and even saying to the kids, see, I told you so. And this is why. This and is this how is why. And this is why. And one thing about authors is that for some reason, kids sometimes will listen to them a little more than they listen to their teachers because this is somebody coming from the outside who has a book and that kind of thing. And they... But even adults do that. If you bring it outside of presenter, it doesn't yeah. matter how many times you tell people. Right. Somebody that has a book, they might have more credential and they listen and you're going, but I told you this 10 times, you didn't listen to me. So right. it's a beautiful way of doing it. It's a great way to do it. Um, another book, the third book in the Honey series is Honey Visits Grandpa Smith. And it's about taking her to visit my dad at his house. And it also has pictures. Um, the illustrations are actually from photographs that I sent um, Laurie. And my dad was an entrepreneur. He was a collector of things and it has lots of appliances and plastic wares and bowls and this kind of stuff appliances that normally kids have no idea what it is they it's, have no idea what it is they're going to look at this phone in this picture that is so real and be like what is that and why right. where's your where's your screen where is that thing at right so what we can do with this is we can do um we can classify items okay so um you guys can't see it, but i have the book open to that page but we could classify and say let's put all of the things that might be in the kitchen in one pile and let's put everything else in another pile we could say let's put all the things that you have to plug into the wall in one pile and everything else in one pile we could say let's put all the utensils in one pile and ways that we communicate with people in one pile and ways that we do other things in another pile. Um, so that's classifying and that's a teak, um, an essential element for lower level students. Um, we actually have a teacher's guide okay. that oh, goes that cool. with um, the three honey books. I had a lady in Corpus Christi, Texas who is um, a curriculum specialist, take the three books and she created four lessons for each title. 
there's a language arts lesson, there's a math lesson, there's a science lesson, there's a social studies lesson for each one of these books. So there's 12 lessons in this teacher's manual. You use the book and you use the manual. It's got everything in it you need. It's got the time frame. It's got, if there's any worksheets, anything like that that needs to go with it, they're all there for you. Um, so this is a great way to incorporate these books into your lessons, into your teaching. It can be used by a librarian, a special ed teacher, um, someone doing a pullout program, anything like that. Um, so you just have to look for teachable, you know, teachable moments is what I call it. I like um, the fact that they come so naturally. Yeah. Because when I'm looking at, especially when we think children's book, you know, you're thinking it's cute, it's sweet, it has all these beautiful images, but to take it and to translate it into a teachable moment, as you're calling it, right? to me has opened up a whole different dimension. You know, what, what is that message? So, right. Um, Honey's Peanut Butter Venture was the second book, and it was probably the most popular. And one great lesson in it is Honey actually gets up on the counter in the kitchen while we're gone and finds her way to the peanut butter. And she opens the door of the cabinet, knocks the peanut butter down to the floor, rolls it to the living room, and ends up with it on the couch with her head stuck in the jar. True story. So Your with dog this book was amazing because I'm yeah. going, Oh God. Yeah. What a mess. And I actually set her up to find out how she did it. And this was back when we had video cameras, if anybody remembers those. So you had a nanny cam for your dog. So I, I set her up because I had to know how she did it. So I set it up. Mom and I went out of the house. We put the garage door down so she would hear it. I ran around the house to the back window by the kitchen with the video camera so I could watch her actually get up on the chair jump over on the counter and walk around to the cabinet oh lord your dog was amazing oh mine is so, cleaning up with a peanut butter but yes so this is a great book because it lends itself to um description words um action words into out of um over under um Probably directional. Directional words. So um, that's a great lesson that they can get from this book. Okay. So, you know, as an educator, I just, I guess I just lend myself to. It is a thing. beautiful thing for parents to do with their kids as well, because this is amazing. Prepositions. I'm sorry. Prepositions. That's the magic word. <laughs> so, yes, it is an incredible thing because I was, I have a um, three year old nephew. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times when we're telling stories, we just tell the story. And right. then it's like the end and we close the book. Right. You know what I mean? So this is opens to opportunities for parents and uncles, grandparents to be able to take these simple stories and explore them and open their imagination even more. So I love right. what you have done with these teachable moments and with these projects and, and actually the maker space. So it has a whole three-dimensional that is a lot more impressionable for their minds. Yes. Absolutely. Do you, do you think your books have a specific message that you think that you would love for kids to understand or for your readers to get? Um, I think there, I go back to my whole platform that everybody has a story. And, you know, these books, the Honey books, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but they're set up as her memoirs. Um, Honey is actually telling the story and she introduces herself as an elderly dog. So this is from the perspective of Honey. Yes. Okay. I so, don't think I got that. So it's kind of like when you visit with your grandparents, they always say, when I was younger, yes. I did this. I remember back when I did this and this and this. So that's how these are set up. Honey's reflecting back over her life and some of her amazing adventures. That is too sweet and such yeah. a beautiful perspective. Right. So everybody has a story. So when I've done presentations before, you know, there might be horses out in a field across the street from the school. And I'm like, those horses have a story. Have you ever thought about it? Well, what do they do all day long? Well, if they could sit down and write a story, they could probably write a story too. So you could actually watch those horses and see what they do. And then you could sit down and write a story for them. 
you know, that kind of thing. So I really want them to understand um, that everybody does have a story, even our pets, animals, and especially with the grand, uh, granny's porch and grandpa's shed, you know, I really want to tie in that relationship between the younger kids and senior citizens and give them an opportunity to see that they have things in common, that they, because in the book, Granny's Porch, you know, the kid in there is singing silly songs and Granny's right there with them singing silly songs. Um, and, you know, the elderly have value. And so um, I think that's, you know, one of the main messages that I want to get through that is that um, we can learn from each other. We have more things in common than we have different. Absolutely. And sometimes we forget that we get too busy and picking the differences between each other instead of looking at all the things we have in common. That is a beautiful message. Yeah. So tell me, do you have a message? We still want the message advice piece for somebody who's aspiring to be an author. What will you tell them? You know, I guess what I would say is um, keep a pad and pencil with you. I like that advice. <laughs> Absolutely. I got no, I got little index cards with me everywhere. Um, I used to have a little bitty cassette recorder that had those little bitty cassettes in it. Now, of course, we have our phones, so we can just go on there and we can record a note or that kind of thing. But um, if you see something that looks interesting, um, Chris Van Allsburg, um are you familiar with his work? I'm not, so tell me. Okay. So he, um, actually probably is one of those people I should have said was one of my favorite authors. You can say it now. We'll he, take it. He had a lot of books that were just pictures and they had just a little tagline with them. And um, they're still on library shelves now. They're not as popular. But what I would do is I would take that picture, um, like that picture that you have on your wall there. Okay. And I would build a story around that picture. For everybody, the picture on my wall is a starry night with lots of trees pointing at the yeah. sky. Um, so I could, I could just start writing, well, where is that? Well, what's going on with that? Well, why are the stars shining so bright? And try to come up with that kind of thing. But for an aspiring writer, I say, you know, um, allow yourself to fail. Which I still love. That is probably one of my favorite yeah. things. And, um, you know, if you can't illustrate, find someone that you like that can, that's willing to... You don't have to do everything yourself. Right. Um, and just take chances, you know, just take chances and see. Um, share your story with others that you feel will be honest and uh, critique you. And don't take critiques as the gospel. Um, receive them, them or don't personal. receive them. Right. Um, but don't give up if that's something that you really want to do because, you know, J.K. Rowling, a lot of people turned her away. And, I mean, do I need to say what no. she's doing? <laughs> you know? Look where she's at. Look where she is now. She I mean, if she had allowed what she was told in the beginning to rule her life, what would she have missed out on? What would the rest of us have missed yeah. out? So I'm very much into yeah. like, I'm glad you didn't give up because the rest of us yeah. need some Harry Potter in our life. Right. So Tom, this is our, my favorite section. I have questions that you have not seen. Okay. So on your feed, first thing that comes to your mind, don't think too hard on it. I'm gonna do a couple of them and see how we can go with them. So they're a little fun and quirky and just to get your mind going a little. So you ready? I'm ready, I get, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> If your main character had a theme song, what would it be? And you can pick any character you want. So you can do Sunny if you want. What would it be? Oh my gosh. I know, aren't they fun? You had to start with that. We gotta start with the hard one first. I'm totally lost. Um, a theme song. <laughs> <laughs> this definitely stumped you. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of something for Granny. I'm trying to think of something for Honey. Um, I think Sunny. Honey is definitely, let's be honest about this, the Mr. Impossible theme song is what I envision when she's trying to get the peanut butter. Okay, we'll go with that. Dun, dun, dun. 
Right. <laughs> Get in my head and answer for me. Help me. What we're going to do a team. You can call okay. a friend. So this one's a little easier since the, okay. since the first song got you there. Okay. And this is specifically for you. Coffee or tea? Tea. Okay. Still you. Beach or lake? Ooh. Um, beach. Okay. If you could pick any food to define you, what would it be? <laughs> any food to define me? Um, I will say fish because they're free. They sp they swim freely and they love to explore. I like that. Yeah. Romantic comedies or action movies? Um. Ooh. Action movies. Okay. I'm glad you said that because the next one's going to test you. Favorite action hero? Like super, like Superman you, you, or whatever? Yeah, whatever or like, you want. Okay, so I'm a fan of the Die Hard series. Okay. So uh, Bruce Willis in the Die Hard. I don't know if he would be considered an action yes. figure, but... Um, yeah, I love all of those. Okay, so if you had to pick between the James Bond movies or the Born Identity, which one? Um, I would probably go with James Bond. So you ready for the new movie? You know, I'm ready. We'll see what happens. I just, um, I just saw the new Star Wars, and and you know, it was okay. It was, I mean, I, Star Wars I was off and on with, so it was good. It answered some questions, are so that's a, always good. Are you a Star Trek fan then? No. Interesting. So if he was Star Wars, then definitely not a Star Trek. Okay. If you had a sci-fi movie, which one would it be? A what? Sci-fi movie. A sci-fi movie? Mm -hmm. Does E.T. count? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I fell in love with E.T., the whole story of E.T., and um, even though that was 100 years ago, but just how we can all live together. The unity of everything. And the unity of everything, and him and Elliot, and, um, you know, how they, in essence, kind of become one in spirit and heart and that kind of thing. Okay. So... So, I hope you did a minor lightning round because you did really well. I'm actually Ooh, pretty impressed. Okay. I don't <laughs> think I did very well. But. That look in your face is like, oh, let's not do that again. So, Tom, tell us, where can we find you? What, what's your social media? What's your website? Where, where can we find and get more Tom? So, um, I have a new website, which I'm really excited about. And it's a real easy address. It's www.tomcgreer, that's G-R-E-E-R, dot -E -E com. And um, I'm also on um, Twitter um, at Tom C. Greer. Uh, Facebook, you can find me at Arc Latex Author. And that's uh, A R K L A T X Author, or by my name. Um, yeah. So just look, I mean, look me up on Amazon. You know, you can look me up on Amazon. The books are on Amazon. Uh, the books can be purchased on the website itself. And that gives you lots of information about me, about the programs that I have, um, the books themselves, that kind of thing. I was going to ask you where we could purchase the books, but you answered that. So we can get yeah. them directly from you from the website, mm -hmm. or we can get them at Amazon as well. So we have options. For any educator, librarian looking mm -hmm. for a program, you can definitely contact you directly. Absolutely. So we are so excited about your new projects. I am so thrilled that you made the trip to see me and spend some time. Yes. So I am fascinated. I'm glad you got to spend some time in Inside the Minds of Authors. So Thank it's you. always fascinating to see how the mind works and everything the authors have going on. So Tom, any closing remarks you want to tell us? Anything that you want to share before we leave? I mean, just dream big dreams. Uh, don't give up. Um, don't be scared of failure. And, um, you know, keep on keeping on. Uh, if there's something that you want, 
fight for it and do what you've got to do to make it a success. I love it. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank I'm you. I'm definitely going to be looking for your next book and also thank these you. amazing projects you have. And for everybody else, thank you so much for joining us inside the Minds of Author. Please stay tuned for a lot more coming up from us and have an amazing day.